One, when will normies understand the cancer that is DEI? When will Mark Cuban understand DEI? Mark Cuban versus George Peterson versus Chris Rufo. Two, our lunch break panel censorship and RFK Jr. And three, who's had it best in sports? Is it NC State right now? Is it UConn? Is it Alabama? Who has had it best in sports? It is the Will Kane Show, streaming live at foxnews.com, the Fox News YouTube channel, the Fox News Facebook page, and always on demand at Apple or on Spotify. Just hit subscribe or watch the Will Kane Show whenever you want, entirety or in exclusive interviews and YouTube shorts by subscribing at YouTube. The Will Cain Show, always on demand at willcainshow.com. We've got a big show today with a lunch break panel that includes Stacey Washington, the host of Stacey on the Right at SiriusXM, and Link Lauren, the senior advisor to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Plus, things are good in Dallas. Mavericks, Rangers, Stars, and Cowboys. But who's had it best? That question is put to the test right now as Alabama, NC State, and UConn are dominating the sports landscape. All that's coming up on this episode of The Will Cain Show, but let's start with story number one. When will normies, when will Mark Cuban, governor of the Dallas Mavericks, understand the cancer that is diversity, equity, and inclusion. When will they understand the cancer that is DEI? Mark Cuban, to his credit, has continued to debate DEI across X. To his credit, he continues to engage, at least on X, with his critics. To his shame, he doesn't seem to understand reality. And maybe reality is a hard thing to get because it requires you to understand political ideology. Most people in the world operate through practicality. Most people don't live in a world of politics. But that doesn't mean that politics doesn't care about them. You may not care about politics, but politics cares about you. And while DEI can be dressed up in fancy or flowery language about giving everyone an equal opportunity, it most certainly is an ideological movement to produce equal outcomes. It most certainly is Marxism. You only have to understand and read. You only have to do what they ask, do the work to understand the underpinnings of DEI. But Mark Cuban, for one, and I think in many ways representative of many normal people out there refuses to understand reality in DEI. Cuban got into it with Chris Rufo. Chris Rufo has been an activist on X who's done a lot of great work in pushing the, to the forefront the reality of DEI. Rufo has laid out numerous companies that have embraced DEI, including CVS Health CEO Larry Merlo, where he talked about their push into DEI. Cuban Posted on X, all very informative. I will try to be clear. Where is a CEO stating they want equality of outcomes for their employees? Cuban's trying to make the argument that nobody actually means equity. Nobody means equality of outcomes. They all mean equality of opportunity. He has tried hard-headedly to make the argument that it simply means putting people in positions to succeed, and that in and of itself means success for your company. He argues it's just good capitalism and that he invests in hundreds, if not thousands of companies. And he doesn't know a CEO that wants equality of outcome. But to that, Rufo has provided him numerous examples from Disney to a host of others across the landscape of corporate America who clearly have embraced the totality of the ideology of DEI. Cuban just seems to refuse that reality. He wants to tailor it. He wants a customization, or he wants to mask the ideology behind a flowery concept that everybody agrees. We want a quality of opportunity. But that's not what is meant by equity. 
no matter how many times Cuban tries to customize his own definition. He's not dealing in reality. He's not dealing with practicality. And I think Jordan Peterson gave a long and deep response that I wanted to read to you in its entirety. It's worth reading in full, even if it is long. Here is the post by Dr. Jordan Peterson. My dear Chris Rufo, if Mark Cuban continues to turn away from the plentiful evidence illustrating the difference between equality of opportunity and equity, it's high time to quit. Pearls, you know. I've talked to dozens of Democrat congressmen and senators alike over the last eight years. Not one would draw a line between the classic liberal in the left and the bloody radicals. Bloody. A very underrated emphasis word used by Canadians and Brits. Peterson continues, seriously, not single one, even if asked repeatedly, even in private, even when prompted. They refuse outright to address what could well be the central issue of our time, which I formulated as a simple question. When does the left go too far? They would never even admit to the existence of the postmodern Marxists, insisting upon oppression at every turn, even though it is those ideologues who completely dominate, for example, the entire educational apparatus. So far as I see, no indication whatsoever that Mr. Cuban has the willingness to draw this necessary distinction, or even to consider the possibility that it might be necessary. In other words, answer the question, when has the left gone too far? He merely makes excuses for those who would have given the opportunity to destroy him and everyone in his circle. This is exactly the attitude that characterized Democrats and modern leadership. It's true even of Dean Phillips and RFK Jr. I asked them both directly, and they have more reason than most on the left to have been once bitten, twice shy. So why is this the case? Peterson continues in a long post that I think is worthwhile to understand. First, Perhaps straightforward refusal to admit the magnitude of the problem. That's the willful blindness I alluded to earlier. Mr. Cuban said on the Lex Friedman show that he couldn't imagine a cabal of therapeutic and medical professionals corrupt enough to enable the current trans epidemic and the butchery that accompanies it. So be it. It's understandable. Who wants to see that? But even liberals like Michael Schellenberger have said they had their head in the sand for two years. So, Peterson offers up, maybe Cuban is simply willfully ignorant. Second, perhaps Cuban, like other moderate once liberals, also harbors a desire to have it both ways. He's wildly rich and more power to him insofar that he's earned it productively. But he also wants to play benevolent ally to those screaming victims. The desire for both forms of status simultaneously is simply too much to ask for, just as in the case with Ivy League students claiming their faux allegiance to the dispossessed. And third, finally, Mr. Cuban, like the other moderates, also appears to not understand that the true dark tetrad types, the true narcissists, manipulators, psychopaths, and sadists, habitually disguise themselves in the cloak of oppression. This heightens their danger, as that adopted status allows them to reputation savage and to even steal with an attitude or moral superiority. Property, after all, is theft. So he asks Cuban, do you think the typical DEI advocate is more or less likely, say, than the typical liberal to hold that view? If yes, then think it through. If you believe that the correct answer is no, then that's more comprehensive evidence that you don't understand the ideological terrain. In my estimation, adding to Peterson, you don't understand reality. The leftist moderates in the West appear hell-bent on learning everything about human nature the hard way. It's too bad that the rest of us will be dragged along for the ride. Hang on, it's about to get bumpy. I think that's a very deep and accurate understanding of reality from Dr. Jordan Peterson. And my suspicion is, for guys like Mark Cuban, there's a large part of option two, that by getting so rich there is in its essence a luxury of liberalism that is bought and displayed like the nouveau rich. It's like buying a sports car, but in this case, you're buying a rosy reputation. You're also, I guess, absolving yourself of some guilt for what you've earned, for your wealth. And so you become a champion of the victim, even if that victim is truly, as he points out, a sadist, a dark tetrad. 
I don't think Cuban fully understands reality because perhaps he's unwilling to consider that although he may not care about politics, he cares about business. That doesn't mean politics doesn't care about Mark Cuban. Cuban responded to Peterson and Rufo with the following post. He said, also in a long post, first of all, my arguments are not abstract. I own or invest in hundreds of companies. I know DEI is a positive because I see its impact on bottom lines. That's reiterated by my many CEOs. The definitions of DE and I are not theoretical. They are actually used. Are yours? You have sides. I don't. I'm an entrepreneur and a capitalist. I look for results. That's why. That's what I base my decisions on. Every single person on Twitter could disagree with me. I would still follow the results I see in my portfolio. Chris, Jordan, you're running businesses, building a community, and selling to it. This platform, meaning X, is a target-rich environment for you. You sell hard, as you should. I respect your efforts. I may vehemently disagree with your positions, but I respect entrepreneurial grind and always will. But Twitter is not reflective of the real world. Bottom line, I'll keep stating my positions on here specifically because they're the opposite of yours, Elon's, and others. I don't think this is a fair post. I don't think Chris and Jordan are simply on the grind trying to build an audience that indicts their motives, that indicts why they hold their opinions, not that they actually believe the cancer that is DEI. I think Mark is the one that's denying reality. Mark doesn't understand this even as it comes for him. DE and I are not customizable acronyms. You don't get to make equity equality. Why don't you get to make it? Because nobody else around you is doing so. And that's practical. That's not abstract. Everyone in your DEI department is running on the same premise as Jordan Peterson. Everyone in academia is running on the same premise that is Jordan Peterson. He understands the ideological radical lines, as do those activists. Your companies are not immune, and your customization is a head in the sand. It does not reflect reality. And DEI is a cancer to Peterson's point, that threatens not just the United States of America, but the foundational values of Western civilization. That might be a reality worth recognizing, and that might be a reality worth fighting. Let's discuss this and the role of censorship and RFK Jr. with one of the lead surrogates for RFK, his senior advisor, Link Lauren, and the host of Stacy on the Right on Sirius XM, Stacey Washington, with our lunch break panel next on the Will Kane show. I'm Dana Perino, co-host of The Five and co-anchor of America's Newsroom. Join me for my brand new podcast, Perino on Politics. Listeners of Everything Will Be Okay will gravitate toward this podcast, too. Every Monday, I'm going to talk to people I trust in politics as they tell me what they're seeing and thinking in the 2024 election cycle. As they prep me to cover the upcoming election, they'll prep you, the voters, too. Make sure you subscribe to this series on foxnewspodcast.com or wherever you download podcasts and leave a rating and review. Is this the start of a NASCAR dynasty for Ryan Blaney? Ready to go to work. A redemption tour for Chase Elliott? Is Denny Hamlin a ruthless competitor or a villain? Is it time for a Bubba Wallace breakthrough? Ross Chastain to give back to breaking stuff? Or is this the making of the wildest ride you'll ever witness? Hey! It's all of the above, and it's about to go down. Yeah! Let's go! Woo! The NASCAR Cup Series from Martinsville. Coverage begins Sunday at 2 Eastern on FS1. From the Fox News Podcast Network. I'm Emily Campagno, and this is the Fox True Crime Podcast. And I had nothing to do with her disappearance, but people still accuse me of it. I sit down with the people who lived the nightmares. I was in shock. I was just devastated. The investigators who tirelessly worked on the case. I feel for their families, and I really hope that they can catch this guy. Bringing you closer to the story than you ever thought possible. Listen and follow now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Why does an RFK Jr. have secret service assignment? Is he and everyone else being censored? And is cancer of DEI something that's not even understood by RFK Jr.? Let's get into that with our lunch break panel. It is the Will Cain Show streaming live at foxnews.com, the Fox News YouTube channel, and the Fox News Facebook page. 
always on demand at willcaneshow.com. She is the host of Stacy on the Right on Sirius XM. It is Stacy Washington. He's a senior advisor to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He is Link Lorne. They join us, join us today on our lunch break panel on the Will Cain Show. Thanks, guys, for being here. Glad to have you. Thank Thanks you. For having me back. Um, you know, Link, I was just talking about Mark Cuban. I was talking about <laughs> DEI, and I was talking about an exchange that he has had on X with both Chris Rufo and with Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson had a long and fascinating post in response to Mark Cuban, which I just talked about here on The Will Cain Show. In that, he brought up Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He talked about the risk that DEI runs essentially to Western civilization and defining people along the lines of race. He also talked about that this is a very hard thing for even moderate liberals to understand, the true risk and meaning of DEI. In it, he said that he has spoken to moderate Democrats, even Dean Phillips and RFK Jr. He asked them both directly, and they have more reason on the left the most having been once bitten, twice shy. But he suggests even they don't understand DEI and the threat of DEI, Link. So for me, I've always been a firm believer in a meritocracy. I mean, if you're going to have surgery, do you want the doctor who got into medical school because of DEI or the person who got in on their own merits? I also feel in a way it's a sort of racism to expect less of certain minorities, right, to lower thresholds. We should be building a society where everyone can flourish and just fixing the education system in general. So I've never been a fan of a DEI initiative. I also think DEI has been used and weaponized in so many ways in our society. So I'm all about merits and a merit-based society and not for DEI. And, and just to clarify, do you think that is something, an opinion that you just shared and an understanding that you just shared? There's a difference between equality and equity, and there's a difference mm -hmm. between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. Do you think that is understood by Robert F. Kennedy Jr.? Definitely. From my conversations with him, he wants everybody, everybody to succeed, but in a way that's fair and equitable. Stacey, what do you think? You think that society's at large, the conversation I just had here on The Will Cain Show is that Mark Cuban, while I think he is individually being willfully ignorant and blind <laughs> and attempting to customize his own definitions of DEI, I actually think in some ways he's also representative of normal people out there, um, maybe who aren't that into politics, who wa want to look, and I think in their own minds would say this, look beyond race or um, grant everyone an opportunity, but I just, I just think they don't understand that's not DEI. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. I'm listening to Link, and I, it, this, this mirrors so many conversations because I've, I've actually sought out some individuals who happen to be black, who are minorities, other minorities, to talk about DEI and to understand why they're proponents of it. And I universally get back that in their minds, these proponents of DEI, they're saying they want to level the playing field and make it possible for people to understand why not accepting other people based on their race or their characteristics is a bad thing and that it harms business. And that DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, when applied properly to a workforce, enables everyone within that workforce to set aside any preconceived notions and accept those team members in for the benefit of that corporation. But what we've seen in practice is that it doesn't work that way. DEI, when put into corporate settings, educational settings, any setting, it actually puts people at odds with each other. It creates division. And there's this thing that they've said with their own mouths that blacks are always victims, whites are always oppressors, white people are animals. I watched a video today that I'd forgotten I'd ever seen. It's a, a, a rotund woman. She's giving a briefing to a small group of people. All the people she's briefing are white. She's black. And she tells them, you are actually animals because you're racist. And even if you're working to be an ally, you can never get your humanity back. Now, I, I ask you, you know, I'm, I'm a parent, we, our kids, I don't want my kids going into a classroom and being taught that no matter where they are, whenever they enter a space, they enter that space as a victim. That actually is detrimental to their ability to achieve in any environment that they would go into. So I keep hearing this from the proponents of DEI that they just want to eliminate the ability of people to just basically clamp down on other people based on their characteristics. But in practice, this is a, an effort that extends out of Marxism well, and Link right. expressed it perfectly there succinctly. It is not workable within our meritocracy.
Mm-hmm. Well, so real quick, Stacy, and, and for anyone listening on podcast, and many are watching on on YouTube, you're black. You have an access to a conversation within the black community, and I think a level of honesty that probably would escape a lot of people that are white. I mean, you're just having real conversations about this. And what I'm curious about is, I think it was I recently had on. I don't want to misattribute this. Um, but I think it was Marcellus Wiley, an old friend of mine from ESPN. And he said, I just simply read, you know, I just, I just went to BLM. I just simply read what their mission statement was. You know, I just simply read about the ideology behind DEI and it's not hard. It's not like it's hidden. The advocates are open about the Marxist underpinnings, you know, but when you talk to people who aren't, um, activists, Stacy, who are just real people out there who internalize it the way that you just described, I mean, is it is it like falling on deaf ears the way that Jordan Peterson is falling on Mark Cuban's deaf ears? Oh, you're being too political. That's not what it means. Oh, you're saying that. But I actually think it just means these flowery things about equality. Or, or is there any way to break through? Like, no, you have to understand. It's not hidden. Here's what they mean by DEI. So I do, I do tend to get that initially. But as you go a little further in, I, I interviewed a man, his name is escaping me at the moment. I can't believe this on the Will Kane podcast. I'm having a brain freeze, but he is a, he's a scientist, right? He's not a famous guy at all. He's not a part of the political class or punditry. He doesn't talk for a living. He actually researches for a living. And he was talking about how the, the NIH, uh, National Institute of Health, has this new program. And in it, in order to get funds from that program as a researcher, you have to check a box. You have to be a minority. Now, he recently found out about a decade ago that his father had passed for white his whole life. So he's actually partially of African-American extraction. So this program is targeted at him because he can say, I'm black. He can check that box and he will automatically get funding. But if he doesn't check it, even though his research is worthy of the funding, he can't get a penny. And he's upset about that because he also has experienced people thinking that he's in the space now that they know he's part black because he utilized affirmative action, which he did not. He didn't find out he was black until after he'd already gotten his entire education out of the way. And this is something that goes on everywhere. I mean, there was a huge conversation. Did you see Charlie Kirk talking about how if he sees a black pilot, he automatically thinks, I hope he's not a DEI hire. Well, that's hugely insulting Mm. to black pilots who became pilots before DEI was ever a thing. And then for people anywhere, any space, you think, oh, she's black. She's got a show on Sirius XM because they needed a black face. That's highly insulting to me. I've been doing radio for 40, 14 years, and I'm actually, I was born to talk. I, I like hit the 50,000 words a day when I was five years old. So I'm, I'm, I'm not here because of affirmative action. My boss will tell you why she mm-hmm. chose me. It's not because I'm black, but DEI hurts people who are qualified, who belong someplace, who earned it, because people automatically assume you don't actually, you, you didn't earn that. And that's really well, rough to take. Oh, I bet. Yeah, I mean, I, and by the way, whatever Charlie Kirk said, it's basically the same thing that was said by uh, Supreme Court yeah. Justice Clarence Thomas. Um, he yep. said the same thing, like affirmative action undercuts the merit of those that came through because it it layers on, logically, the presumption, oh, you didn't have to earn it in the same way that someone else did because you had some program that that, that advantaged you. Um, I want to move to this. I just want to know and, and also I'm glad you're real here quick. To, sure. Oh, if I could cut sure. in, I was going to say, as someone from Dallas, you know, I've interacted with Mark Cuban. I know you're a Texas guy too, Will. You went, you grew up in Sherman. My brother went to college in Sherman. When did Mark Cuban become such a ridiculous character? I feel like he's become so cringeworthy. <laughs> and then also, like, with the Mavericks, you want to talk about DEI. Would Mark Cuban ever hire a player who was, like, five foot two? You know what I'm saying? Like, talk about DEI when it comes to his team. I don't know. He's hiring people who are the best players, period. He's not lowering his thresholds and hurting his bottom line. So I think he's a little bit hypocritical with all of this DEI stuff. So I don't know where we lost Mark Cuban along the way, but it is really funny (laughs) to watch. No, you're right. And by the way, I live in Dallas now. And in in a lot of ways, it's hard for me not to be a fan of Mark Cuban. I'm for at least a big chunk of it. I'm a big Mavericks fan, and he's done a pretty good job, although it's debatable at this point, with the Mavericks. And and so— and when he first came out, you know, to your point of his change, like he was kind of, I remember him talking about Ayn Rand and some really like interesting political and logical thoughts and these kind of things. And, and now he's indistinguishable 
from the flag that people put in their yard, the sign, you know, in this home, you know, love is love and no person is illegal. And, you know, the, just the cliched left, um, you know, Cracker Jack mm-hmm. box politics. He's indistinguishable mm-hmm. from that. And I don't know. I don't know what changed with Mark Cuban. No, I'm not from Texas, right. but I'll just check. I mean, I don't live there. I was actually born in Fort Hood, Texas, yeah. but I'm I'm a Missourian now. It's been 24 years. But I'll say, Will Link, I always have respected him from his time on Shark Tank. He was always one of the most interesting uh, <laughs> owners on, on Shark Tank. When he would assess whether or not to buy a business, he always used some of his his business acumen and background to ascertain whether the product was even marketable. And then he would go in with these kind of vicious, like I'm taking 61%, but here's what you get out of the end of that. And I, I found him to be mm. fascinating. Mm-hmm. So this new Mark Cuban, that's not my Mark Cuban. My Mark Cuban was back in the shark tank days. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, um, Link, I'm glad, I'm glad you're here. I want to put this to you. So um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Mm-hmm. was on CNN mm-hmm earlier this week with Aaron Burnett, Mm -hmm. and here's how it went. Let's watch. I can argue that President Biden is because the First Amendment, Aaron, is the most important. Adams and Hamilton and Madison said, we put the guarantee of freedom of expression in the First Amendment because all of our other constitutional rights depend on it. If you have a government that can silence its opponent, it has license for any atrocity. So it, just to be clear, you're saying you could make an argument that President Biden is a worse threat to democracy than, than Donald Trump. That's what you just said. But who else has so, ever tried to who else has ever tried to send what president in history mm-hmm. has ever tried to censor political opponents? He makes the argument, Link, that yes, Joe Biden is a greater threat to democracy than Donald Trump because Joe Biden undercuts the essential foundational element of this experiment, which is freedom of speech. Mm-hmm. Right. No, I feel like without the First Amendment, we have nothing else. I mean, that's one of the cornerstones of our entire campaign. That's part of the reason Bobby even got into the race was because he was being censored. Right. And I think it's just so unconscionable to see the Biden administration allegedly colluding with big tech and social media companies to push down certain content, elevate other content. It's just really gross to see, especially from the president of the United States. But we could argue who's more of a threat to democracy all day long. I also just think Joe Biden doesn't have the character to be president of the United States. Like I said the other day, I mean, this is a guy who authored the 1994 crime bill. This is a guy who said he didn't want his kids to grow up in a racial jungle. This is a guy who took over a year to go and visit East Palestine, Ohio. He's allowing the largest invasion ever at the southern border. This is complete dereliction of duty. So we could argue who's a greater threat and this and that. Joe Biden, we have to get him out of office come November. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and this is a guy talk about someone like Mark Cuban who's changed over time. You talk about Joe Biden's past positions, and this is a guy that now acknowledges trans day of visibility on Easter, by the way, and mm-hmm. then denies it. So we don't know exactly um, who put out that tweet or who made that proclamation. But one thing Biden I will say about Joe Biden is he'd rather have Dylan Mulvaney and these people come to the White House. He's had people like that come to the White House more and topless trans people on the White House lawn than he's had service members or military members. So we see He's more focused on identity politics. Right. Mm -hmm. He's more focused on identity politics, gender ideology, than family, faith, religion, all of these things that are the the cornerstone of our society. And I just don't think Joe Biden, even 10 years ago, would recognize the Joe Biden today. What do you guys think? No, No, definitely not. Stacey? Yeah. No, well, so he wouldn't. And Link, you were speaking my language. I've done that rundown a million Mm -hmm. times. I've memorized it. Mm -hmm. All the things Joe Biden has said about black people, right? I just focus on that. If you don't vote for me, then you ain't so friendly. Apparently, you ain't black. All of that stuff that he said about black Americans, that black women were stacking the shelves during COVID and enabling him to buy food, as if he's been in a grocery store in the last I don't know how many years. Look, he's been in politics longer than we've been alive. And this is a, a thing that he does now. He just he caters to the far left of their party. But I, I want to I wanna go back to something here. When we talk about who's doing what when it comes to censoring, shutting down dissent, attacking political opponents, it mm-hmm. was the moment of the campaign when 
then candidate Donald Trump was on the Washington University campus in St. Louis debating Hillary Clinton. And he said, well, she'd be in jail to the in response to the question of what would happen if he were president. Mm -hmm. He then went on to spend four years not prosecuting Hillary Clinton, not prosecuting any of the Democrats who'd done wrong things. And now we have President Biden, who never made any promises on the campaign trail. He's actually using the Department of Justice and other agencies to clamp down on political speech to attack pro-lifers, and most importantly, to launch a campaign of terror upon the personhood of Donald Trump, who is his opponent in the election this year. So I agree with you, Link, and I think that mm -hmm. Bobby, when he was talking on, on television about that, he kind of, it seems, surprised the interviewer. I can't even believe, like, this is a woman who does <laughs> politics for a living. How could she be surprised by what he said? The question itself was uh, inane and nonsensical. Mm -hmm. Of course it's Biden. Of course it's the Democrats. This is their new heavily weaponized Democrat party in action against anyone who doesn't vote for them. Right. And it's like, well, you want to talk about democracy. Joe Biden didn't even want to have a primary. He didn't want to have a debate. He's pretty much been hiding out. He never has unscripted conversation. So we want to talk about democracy. Joe Biden isn't even upholding the principles of his own party, you know, pushing people off of ballots, trying to imprison his political opponents. Even our campaign, you know, Barack Obama got secret service 551 days out from the election. You understand, we still don't have Secret Service and have requested so many times to Mayorkas and everybody. So this is totally the weaponization of these government agencies by Joe Biden. What is your understanding on why there's been no Secret Service assigned to Bobby Kennedy? Oh, we get no real reason. You either don't get a response or this, they say you're not a serious enough candidate. How are we not serious enough candidates at this point? Let's be honest. They don't want to give us secret service because it validates that we are serious candidates. You know, okay. it's absolutely ridiculous. I also think the secret service thing is a way to bleed us of our campaign funds. They know we're going to have to pay for our mm -hmm. own security and we need to use that money for ballot access. And they know that we're giving Joe Biden a run for his money. You know, Joe Biden, the DNC, they wanted a coronation. They did not want any competition. You know, they tried to push out Marianne Williamson, Dean Phillips. They tried to push us out. And that's just not what this country is about. Americans deserve to have a choice. I'm sorry they don't want people to have a choice. They're pro-choice in every other area, except for giving Americans a choice in the election. It's very bizarre. Well, well it's to what both of you guys are saying, it's, it's, no, yeah. it's no surprise mm -hmm. that, that Democrats and Joe Biden are guilty of the sins that they accuse others. Um, you pointed out, Link, all these different ways in which they're subverting democracy while saying that they are the protectors of democracy. It's mm -hmm. no surprise they call everyone else a racist while embracing neo-racist uh, politics. It is mm -hmm. absolutely propaganda 101. Accuse someone else of the sins which you are you are committing. I think with that being said, get ready because this is the theme of 2024. It will be the end of democracy. That's going to be the overwhelming, you know, sort of fear mongering mm -hmm. that we're going to be experiencing over the next couple of couple of months. That and to your point, like everybody's racist. If you're you're not black, if you don't right. vote for Joe Biden, yep. If I could and, hop and in, so it's, I, it's interesting. If you look at, no, I was just going to say, if you look at the focus group in polling, Republicans say their top issues are immigration, economy, housing, these kitchen table issues. Democrats are polling. Their top issue in these focus groups are threats to democracy. So Democrats know they have to paint Donald Trump and RFK Jr. as threats to democracy in order to get people to show up at the polls. The Democrats can't win on immigration. They can't win on the economy. They can try to gaslight us all day long that Bidenomics is working. We know Bidenomics isn't working. The only the, the only way the Democrats can win is by painting everyone else as evil and horrible and deplorable. Which is why the GOP has Stacey. to stay on message. And so I I'm I, I this is my favorite thing to talk about. So first of all, we are not mm -hmm. sure. We we can be sure of nothing at this point. But if there's one thing we know, it's that in November. We don't have any assurance that it will actually be Joe Biden who is facing Donald Trump and RFK. So what we have to do is we have to talk about what is what matters to Americans. You mentioned the kitchen table. I have to put 25 cents in a jar mm -hmm. every time I mention it on the radio because we say it so much. But the fact is, people are <laughs> dealing with some extraordinary circumstances, right? Double digit inflation. Groceries are 25 percent more mm -hmm. than they were a, a, three years ago. And the worst of it is eleven thousand four hundred dollars spent more per year for the same lifestyle you lived under Trump. Only your raises haven't matched the inflation. So you're really in the negative even further than that. 
But the most important part of this is the Democrat policy is the open borders. It's not just Biden who's doing that. All of the Democrats are working in concert to keep the border open, to keep our natural gas and energy industry under their boot, to disenfranchise Americans, to take away choice in elections like they're doing with RFK by not allowing him to run directly against Biden as a Democrat. So all of these things are Democrat policy. And what I'm talking about is the contrast between that and Republican policy, which is the opposite. It's what we saw during the Trump years and even more now that the party has fully turned into a populist environment that respects working people. 500, uh, if you make 500,000 or more, 65% of those people are actually voting for the Democrats. So just speak about who is, who is mm -hmm. for the little man and who's for the big man. It's very clear. So, Link, I see you nodding along while Stacey talks, and I'm listening to you here today, mm -hmm. and you sound like somebody that would vote for Donald Trump. I don't know what your voting history is in the past or where your political positions differ from someone who would describe themselves as a conservative, but how do you find yourself as a senior advisor then and, and championing um, RFK Jr.? Well, it's a really interesting story because I started covering politics on TikTok in the spring. So I would make these videos breaking down the election and what was going on in the political arena. And then a bunch of campaigns started reaching out. So the Kennedy campaign reached out and said, we'd love for you to come and film with Bobby. And then Vivek Ramaswamy said, do you want to come to Iowa? We can film. So I love Vivek. I love his whole team. And then it sort of was a cascade from there. And then this fall, the RNC invited me to come and cover the debates, and I'm incredibly grateful for them. And then around October, the Kennedy campaign reached out and said, would you like to come work for us? You can have a seat at the table, be an equal partner and everything. And I said, of course. I mean, who at my age would turn down a chance to be a part of the political process and have a seat at the table? Well, and I'm curious then, I don't, again, I, I don't know your personal politics beyond what you've, you've shared with mm -hmm. us today, but like I've said this on this program, there's a lot that I like about, our, uh, about Bobby Kennedy. There's a lot. And I think mm -hmm. that a lot that's happening to him is wrong, but it never escapes me. He is a liberal. Like he does, I don't know where, you know, I'd, I'd love for him to come on my show, but talk about where we might differ. It sounds like we don't differ on free speech. We have a lot of overlap on COVID. We probably have differences of opinion on on climate change. Um, so, like, what is it about him and his politics that that appeal to you? I mean, I'm not wrong, right? I mean, he is a liberal. Well, he did leave the Democratic Party, and I'd love for you to have him come on and have a whole long conversation. There's no one who's a better advocate for RFK Jr. than RFK Jr. All I can say is, I've gotten to know this man. He has the character, the grit, the determination. He's a very honorable man, and I love working for him and, and working with him. Mm. Yeah, I believe all that to be true. Yeah, I, I believe, yeah. I definitely believe all that to be true. And I'll say this too. I mean, I have friends who work on Trump's team, and they say incredible things about Trump. So I'm not knock knocking Trump whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? But I was offered a chance to work on this campaign and be a part of the political process. And I feel so humbled and grateful even to be here, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, you know, I can Stacey, add that, of course, he has Will, he has uh, Angela Stanton King working for him, and she's a pro-lifer. She actually runs a pro-life home for women who are un having unexpected pregnancies. Um, he is actually a supporter of abortion up until, you know, right before birth, but he has moderated on some of the policy around his abortion stance because of Angela Stanton King's work on the campaign. I would just love to see him move firmly into the pro-life Democrat category because there are at least 24 million Democrats who are pro-life who don't have a home with the Democrats any longer. And they could be a part of this coalition of independents that now Bobby Kennedy is leading. And so I'd, I'd love to see him do that. But for me, a lot of his other issues that he's on the left on, I would expect that because he was recently a Democrat. He's an independent. He right. hasn't said he's a Republican. But there are some things that to me, transcend, like the ability to be alive, to not be snuffed out in the womb because of the inconvenience of your parents. That's something I think if he if he feels in, it's right to have bodily autonomy with the vaccines, then he should feel that human beings that happen to be living in their mom's womb for a short defined period of time should have the right to live just as much as I have the right not to be injected with a vaccine I don't want to take. So I, I'd, I'd love, you guys can have that combo. I'll, I'll watch and retweet. Look, I, that's okay. Please. You know, and here's why I want to have the convo. And 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 I'm not and you know, I'm not trying to force you, Link, or him into the false dichotomy that American politics has been forced for quite some time. I don't care if he's a Republican. I don't care what his political party identification is. I don't think it fits anymore. 
I don't think the the spectrum of left to right that we have been taught over the past half a century is the one that exists in America today. I don't think the issues fit, you know, and and I I you know, if he's an independent, that's awesome. All it does is put it kind of like I do think he should show up on the Will Cain show. I do think he should expound upon all of his views because that is not just as a personal plug. I, I think that someone, how about this? That unique, who's not willing to accept politics as a crackerjack box of here's the way it is, and I'm selling you a prepackaged, um, you know, litany of issues, should really expound upon where he is on all of the issues. You know what I mean? If he's independent on all these, then I want to hear it. To Stacy's point, let's talk mm-hmm. about life. To my point, let's talk about climate change. You know, I want to hear more mm-hmm. about some of the stuff that he doesn't often talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting when he goes on all these shows, they only want to talk to him about vaccines. And he's like, I'd love to talk about a myriad of other things. But whenever he goes on a mainstream network, let's be honest, like MSNBC or CNN, a lot of the times, they always want to say, you're an anti-vax conspiracy theorist. And they want to fill up the whole segment with vaccine stuff. And he's like, I would love to talk about all these other platforms and issues. And so I will definitely call him up, Will, and I'll tell him to get on the Will Cain show. Um, but yeah, they lack diversity advocate. of thought, Link. The the interviewers lack diversity no, exactly. of thought, like as Biden would say. Yes, uh, you know, I I think and that's Vivek an interesting would... conversation because I don't know anything about uh, Bobby Kennedy's views on, let's say, the war in Ukraine. Detailed, you know, what would he right. do if he were the president? How would he stop that war? And also the nonsense mm-hmm. about calling for a ceasefire when hostages still exist six months in 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 uh, Gaza. So there there are a lot of great conversations to be had, but. On MSNBC, NBC, ABC, we see the host talking about maybe four things. We hate Trump. Trump's a criminal. And then maybe Mm -hmm. vaccines with Kennedy, but never like they never discuss it with anyone else. They would never have anyone else on to discuss it, to present a regular person point of view or or even a dissenting point of view that is different from the one that Kennedy possesses and the one that Trump possesses. Mm -hmm. So there's more thought out there, but it's hard to get it in the mainstream uh, like discourse. It's hard to get it there. Well, even for me in the and, last year, people ask me all the time, they're like, why are you always going on Fox or Fox News? It's like, I can actually speak my mind. Conservative media is so much more accepting of just having open conversations and honoring the First Amendment. You think like when I went and did something with NBC, I did not have a good time. It was horrible. When I go on Fox, mm-hmm. it's always an amazing time. And so it's just interesting, these liberal stations, they're almost like state run media you would see in some of these other countries like Russia and places like that. You know, MSNBC is just going to peddle pro Joe Biden talking points all day long till Jen Psaki is blue in the face or Joy Reid. And then Joy Reid will say one thing on camera. And when she thinks the camera's off, say a whole complete opposite. So we can have that conversation <laughs> later too, right? <laughs> So. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll chime in. Will, all of us love coming on to Fox. That, that's one of my favorite things we all to do. do. <laughs> well, I'll come on pretty much any time. The only time I ever turn them down is if I'm on vacation and we have a no appearance rule uh, for me while I'm on vacation because I get <laughs> asked a lot. Whenever we go to Florida, people call me and ask me to come on television. And my husband's like, can you not take a week off? And so that's the only time I say no. But yeah, Fox is fun. Well. There's more openness there for you to express yourself than there is if you go on MSNBC or, or the exactly. other. So, I think it, like the yeah. other morning, I had to I get think up it, at 3 a.m. to do Fox and Friends first, and I was so honored to be invited on because MSNBC or these networks, they're not going to invite me on to talk about the Kennedy campaign. They don't want to platform him. I'm shocked Aaron Burnett gave him a full 30 minutes. I mean, he took up most of the hour to talk about his platform, so I was actually really shocked by that, And to, to be frank. Well, I think it's reflective of a confidence of a point of view. In other words, if you're confident mm-hmm. in what you believe, then you should be able to, or what you know, you should be able to confront something mm-hmm. that tells you something different, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're happy to have both of you here on The Will Cain Show. So <laughs> even if we you. had that conversation, even if we had Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on, there's no guarantee that the public would see it. So this is something going on, and Link, you're heavily involved in social media. Um, mm-hmm. First of all, you guys probably know this. I don't know if everybody listening knows this. In order on Instagram or Facebook for you to get political content now, you have to opt in. My friend Katie Pavlich did something on this recently. You got to go into your settings and go down and find content filters where you are opted out of receiving political content. So, you know, it's you just won't see that conversation with RFK on those two platforms. And I don't even know. Mm-hmm. 
on Facebook if you can opt in because they'll still turn it down. I can speak to personal experience Mm -hmm. that political videos on Facebook are receiving minimal traffic right now. A live show like ours is doing really well, but any type of clip will be purposefully turned down. And then there was an article that just came out about YouTube. And YouTube has a whole new program where they plan to do something similar. And it's not just as something that runs afoul of their policies, but it, things that come close to their borders, to their policies, will be de-emphasized. And their thing is like reward. And they have like three R's and a C. Like, and, and the R's are like you're going to reward content you like and you're going to reduce content you don't like. And, you know, to Stacey's point earlier, like whether or not the government is incentivizing this or cajoling them behind the scenes, we know that's history. But by their own choice as well, you're just not getting it. You're not going to get a full point of view anymore, even on the Internet, uh, Link. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm so happy someone like Elon Musk bought Twitter so you can actually speak your mind. And I know Mark Cuban's very upset about that. He's very upset that now we can have free speech and the First Amendment on Twitter. But social media really is the only place you can circumvent the mainstream media. So it's very disheartening when you see like YouTube and Facebook suppressing certain content, prioritizing others. And we never hear Joe Biden speak out about this. He's supposed to be the president of the United States, and he won't even honor the Constitution and the First Amendment. Yeah. Yeah. Stacey, I mean, people talk a lot about, you know, legacy media, you know, Fox or Sirius XM would fall under that, even though it's satellite radio, you know. Mm -hmm. But you're on. I'm on. And as much as I appreciate the Internet and Elon Musk and as much as I appreciate X, I do wonder every time I upload something, not on X, but every time I upload something anywhere else, I'm like, wow, who's going to control who gets to see this? Yeah, I, I think it's it's just as you've described here and they're admitting it. So we can go ahead and take that to the bank since they're now they're, they're unabashedly saying, look, we've got to influence this election. We're running a guy who doesn't know what day it is. He doesn't know when his son passed away. He's he's, he's got dementia. So we got to help him. We got to help this man. And it's the the force of all evil, Trump, who's running against him. So, of course, they have to do something. It would be immoral not to. But I saw a story about an unsealed document. It's from a legal group that's representing advertisers who are suing Facebook for basically something similar here, only it was a deep partnership that they had with Netflix. Reed Hastings was then CEO of Netflix, and he was on the board of Meta, which is Facebook's parent company. And for the decade he was there, he was creating a relationship where they shared their machine learning, artificial intelligence, and Titan API using that to transfer data, my my personal messages, because I didn't have Messenger, but I was a friend of people who did, so my messages were shared as well. They had biweekly reports going to Netflix, and in exchange, Netflix spent about $100 million a year towards the end of that relationship, uh, basically on advertising. And so other advertisers were placed at a disadvantage so that they could use their preferred partner, which was one of their board members. So it was kind of, it's a messy relationship. And as I was reading that story, I realized this is the 18th instance of Facebook violating their compact with users that they would give us a chance to opt in or opt out of the sharing of our data. So will I say, you know, first of all, there's nothing new under the sun. It's not a shock that YouTube is now admitting this. But when you upload something and you have no confidence it will be seen, when I send a message and I have to make make sure it's as clean as possible, and I'm pretty boring, I'm, I'm sending messages with babies dancing in it, but still, I, I don't think other people should have the right to read my messages just because I'm using Facebook. So the question is, will we continue to use it? When you talk about your platform here, when you talk about the ability to get views, why would we not go to a preferred place to see things that we want to look at? And that would now be X, Right. That would be the everything mm-hmm. app that Elon Musk is quickly ramping up into our into our lives. Why would you stay on Facebook if you know that they're going to violate mm-hmm. your privacy when you can have the freedom from that over on X? And that's going to be the decision that people are making in the future going forward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and I know the answer, by the way, because that's where the biggest number of people are. You know, they're on Facebook, they're on YouTube, but you're exactly right. I mean, what's the point if it doesn't matter how many people there are, if none of them get to see your stuff? 
you know, yep. so you're exactly right. And the market, in, in, on the plus side, the market will sort that out. It should on both the consumer side and, and on the, both the producer side and the demand side, the consumer side. Um, all right, Link Lauren, a senior advisor to Arcade. Where can we find you on social media, Link? You just talked about how they, the campaigns discovered you. How can we discover you on social media? So you can find me on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram. Just type in Link Lauren. And thank you so much for having me, Will. Hopefully we can come back on and talk about more fun topics, but everything's so doom and gloom today. <laughs> Serious. I'll make that promise to you. I know. I was like, I'll make that promise to you. Podcast. Everybody's like, it's going to be fun going to Will Kane's show. And it's like, why is he still on? And I'm like, oh my God. Have some fun, you guys. All right. Next time, (laughs) next time, look, I burned up all my content this week talking about Perfect Match on Netflix, which I binged. All right. And my favorite. And my favorite cities in the United States. So, yeah, I did rein, rein it back into a little more seriousness today. But next time, Link, next time. And Stacy right, Washington, well. <laughs> Stacy on the right on Sirius Everywhere. XM. Yeah, on, on all my Everywhere. social media, it's all the same. Stacy on the right. You can find me there and follow. And I do have fun Instagram. I have, my hobby is interior design. So you can see my maximalist situation I have going on. It's French country and maximalism because I've been all over the world. And I've been to France four times. And so my house wow. looks like that. That's my actual house house people always ask me is that your place i'm like yeah that's where i actually live i broadcast from well, there bonjour there bonjour stacy <laughs> <I'm> nice, <laughs> nice to meet you too <laughs> nice to meet you Lincoln. all right guys Fantastic. next time next time we talk about perfect match thanks for being on the will kane show <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. you all right all right coming up who's got it best it's pretty good in dallas right now it's really good in dallas right now And both NC State and UConn are in the Final Four for the men's and women's NCAA tournament. But who's had it the best? That's coming up on The Will Cain Show. I'm Dana Perino. Join me for my podcast, Perino on Politics. Every Monday, I'm going to talk to people I trust in politics as they tell me what they're seeing and thinking in the 2024 election cycle. When it comes to campaign cash, President Biden is saying, show me the money. But will it help him come November? This week, I'm joined by the president and CEO of Squared Communications, Michael Meehan, for a look at the challenges ahead for the Biden campaign. Available now on Apple, Spotify, and foxnewspodcast.com. Saturday on FS1. There's never been a lineup like this. Three MVPs. Oh my goodness! Four silver sluggers. And more all stars than you can count. You gotta be kidding me! Led by Shohei Otani, Mookie Betts, and Freddie Freeman. The Dodgers take their show on the road to Wrigley, where Cody Bellinger and the Cubs await. Saturday at 3 30 Eastern on FS1. Stay on top of the latest forecast with America's weather team in the palm of your hands. Here's the latest from America's Weather Center. It's Fox weather updates throughout your busy day, every day. Five inches of rain by tomorrow. Temperatures being 30 degrees above average. Put the power of over 100 meteorologists and the worldwide resources of Fox in your hands with the Fox Weather Podcast. Precise, personal, powerful. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com. pretty good in Dallas. It's pretty good if you're a fan of the Wolf Pack, North Carolina State. It's pretty good if you're a Husky, a fan of UConn. And it's pretty good if you're a fan of Alabama. But is it the best? It's the Will Cain Show streaming live at foxnews.com on the Fox News YouTube channel, the Fox News Facebook page, and always on demand. We just got done talking with Stacey Washington and Link Lauren about that so much in digital media is turned down. Well, in order to protect yourself from something never reaching your attention, you just have to subscribe. You consciously opt in, and I hope you will do so, to The Will Cain Show on Apple or on Spotify or on YouTube. You hit subscribe, and you don't have to worry about whether or not they'll turn you down. It will show up right in to your feed. Last week here on The Will Cain Show, I talked about Dallas. Pretty good right now. I mean, three straight 12-5 and five seasons, even if it meets playoff failure for the Dallas Cowboys, a World Series championship for the Texas Rangers, Dallas Mavericks on a hot streak where it all seems to be coming together for Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic, where they seem to be safely in the NBA playoffs, and most are projecting them 
to make a run, which they did just two years ago to make it to the 2022 Western Conference Finals. And the Dallas Stars are one of the best teams in the NHL, a legit contender for the Stanley Cup. Now, how often do you have all four of your teams, not just playoffs, but contenders? How often is everything this good? And is it the best? Well, right now for fans of UConn Huskies and the North Carolina State Wolfpack, it's pretty good. Both the men's and women's teams are in the final four of the NCAA tournament this weekend. So if you're into basketball and you go to NC State, you go to UConn, you got a fun weekend ahead of you. It's probably only outdone by the Alabama Crimson Tide, who were in the final four of the men's tournament, and were just in the final four of the college football playoff. Being good at both football and basketball at the same time, that's got to be about as good as it gets. So who's had it the best? And the answer to that, I think, when you look at sur- survey of history, is pretty clear. Man, if you went to the University of Florida from 2005 to 2009, you had it. You had four national titles and the two biggest sports. Florida national champions in football in 06 and 08. National champions in basketball in 06 and 07. If you were there during that time, you had three straight years of national championships. And on one of those, you had two in one season in 2006. That's about as good as I think it can get. Like, I don't see it being better. Most of the time, a football school is not a basketball school. If they are, they're not national championship level. Ohio State's been good at both. You know, Michigan's been good at both, but not at the same time. Not football up, basketball up. It's usually one or the other. It made me even wonder, hey, is is North Carolina State a basketball school? I mean, they do have some national championships under their belt. I think it's two for North Carolina State. And they've never really done a whole lot in football, but I've never thought of North Carolina State as a basketball school. But nobody's had it better than if you were at Florida there, 06, 07, 08. That's about as good as it gets. And unfortunately for me, when it comes to pro sports, whatever's happening in Dallas right now, and maybe we're at the front end, unless the Cowboys are at the tail end, it just doesn't come close to an absurdly good, and no one wants to hear about it because these people always tell you about it, run of people from Boston from 02 to 2019. 17 years of this. And let's just take a minute to realize how good it was up there. All right, starting in 2002, you have the New England Patriots Super Bowl champions in 02, 04, that very same year, World Series champion Boston Red Sox. The next season, Super Bowl champion New England Patriots. They skip a year in 2007, they have the Boston Red Sox World Series champion. In eight, Boston Celtics, NBA champions. A little bit of a dry spell then for Boston. They had to wait a whole three years before the Boston Bruins won the Stanley Cup. Then in 13, it's back to the Red Sox. 15 and 17, two more Patriots Super Bowls. 18, back to the Red Sox. 19, back to the Patriots. So what is that? In 17 years, that's 4, 8, 12 championships for the city of Boston. I don't think anybody's ever been on that kind of heater. No fan base could be more spoiled, more entitled. Celebrate more parades, more championships than Boston. All right, that's going to do it for me today here on the Will Kane Show. Tomorrow, my exclusive interview with The Rock. Make sure you go to YouTube. Make sure you get the Friday edition of The Will Kane Show. We're going to talk about WrestleMania and whether or not he's going to run for president and the story that everyone has forgotten. Maui, it's The Rock on The Will Kane Show. I'll see you next time.